uh, Aaron and Samuel are going to join us now um, to, for the question and answer. Exactly. So I've seen before that Aaron and Samuel were on standby. So we would basically see, um, depending on what question you have, we can directly um, or hopefully have it answered um, by the respective regional. So uh, maybe you could both open your cameras and your microphones, Aaron and Samuel. And in the meantime, Martin, I'll just ask you a question uh, that's come in here. He said about um, institutional capacity building. Who is receiving funds and who is owning the plan? Is it localized? Martin. Yeah, thanks. Um, directly the bullet's eye. So basically, um, the project itself is funded on global level, but for field use. So we receive the funding, but basically it is, let's say, earmarked to be used in the field. So except uh, other, the project managers, all of the activities are happening in country, and also the funding is used there. But the idea of this project, of course, is um, to, to rather bring support for sustainable change. That means also in terms of funding and resources, our time is limited. So we see this project as a Kickstarter to really kickstart and, and um, activities and engagement in country, um, build structures, bring in the expertise for a longer term project. So that means in country quite often, either through the country office that's supporting the project or um, partner organizations, um, um, we have additional funding then that is um, being complemented. Uh, or it can be things like, let's assume, for example, there is really a need for uh, additional warehousing. So we would not be able now to buy and build warehouses, but we might help identify a partner who could do so. So quite often this leads to additional or to a cascading process of additional um, projects and funding mechanisms in country. But generally, all the funding is meant for the field. Okay, Samuel, hello, and both yeah. of you, uh, Aaron and, and Samuel. So Samuel, um, tell me, uh, I mean, you're aiming for 20 countries. So how do you actually uh, determine which countries that you are going to work in? And do you need more funding for that? I mean, we, we're talking about funding there. Will the, you know, funding must be an issue, one assumes. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. So we, we are following a methodology to identify at-risk countries. We, we, we have two approaches, actually. We look at qualitative uh, criteria where countries are at least uh, at risk based on inform index, uh, climate situation, local uh, logistics performance index and others. And then on top of that, since this project has to be implemented with the support of the national actors, we also need to have a feasible uh, local uh, counterpart as well to implement the project. So the funding we have, obviously had uh, allowed us to roll out this project up to 20 countries, but obviously these 20 countries are not the only countries who need this support. If there is additional funding, always there is a room to support other countries. And in addition to that, there is always um, a possibility also to continue our, our activities in some of the countries, especially which have been impacted due to the COVID uh, restrictions and lockdowns uh, last year. Thank you. And uh, Martin was talking, Aaron, um, he was saying about you need to be able to measure how effective and um, yeah. measure change. That, that is quite challenging, isn't it? And um, so you, you're having to what to bring in sort of academic community in this. How do you do this? Yeah, I would like for that question um, to bring Aaron into play. I, I, sorry, I was asking Aaron. I'm, I am sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Aaron. Um, so there's, I think there's two aspects to it. Um, first of all, the, the academic aspect is, is very important. Um, so we are speaking to universities to both to look at the efficacy of the project itself um, and to look at the efficacy of the institutional capacity strengthening framework. Within the framework itself, um, there's a fairly robust methodology, uh, both for measuring uh, systemic change uh, as well as measuring the project's contribution toward that systemic change. And um, I presume, though, that I mean, this is something that is not really it's not been done particularly within the log logistics cluster before. This is something new, isn't it? Uh, the approach is quite different and, and it's it's really stems from what Martin was saying earlier about the classical approach. Um, so it's, it's really taking the, the knowledge and the know-how, um, the, the strategic view that sits behind operational work, uh, and then 
sort of really trying to work with national actors to transfer that to very different national contexts. Uh, so it's, it's while it's coming from the same domain, the, the same knowledge base, if you like, the approach with which that knowledge is transferred is, is very different. So do, do you potentially see that um, this, they are, I mean, you've got it, you're talking about institutional capacity strengthening, but it, you're talking about a method methodology, which could potentially be used in other settings. I mean, this could become a, a blueprint for other areas. Exactly. The, the methodology itself is, um, is agnostic to which field it's, it's being applied. Uh, so it's it's really in this particular case it's it's the layering of the capacity strengthening processes that we saw earlier with Martin, layering that with the very specific uh, knowledge base and experience that the cluster brings in this particular instance. So Samuel, then if you're talking about trying to assess um, how effective it is, do, do, can you? put a price on preparedness, you know, and say uh, that this sort of uh, planning can actually really save money? Well, uh, past studies have been done by uh, different uh, academic institutions, and basically they came up with a uh, rough uh, eye understanding of if humanitarians were able to uh, invest on preparedness in advance, they could have reduced the lead time from skisting to what 30, 40 days. And they could have also even reduced the amount of money needed to be spent on response as well. Because if we, especially when uh, cyclones and natural disasters, we know that which areas are going to be prone to disaster. So if we are able to have a proper coordination always uh, ongoing, if we're able to preposition stocks closer to the disaster areas, then there is a potential saving. So it, it is true. We have not had that opportunity through this project, but maybe one thing that I should add is that at least the national working groups and logistics cert sectors established for the preparedness project have been called upon also to respond to natural disasters in the case of Mozambique and Madagascar uh, recently. Okay, um, there's a question here that um, somebody asked that rather, that, so Aaron, maybe you would take this, rather than one global plan funded for itself, why not engage with local institutes of learning and support their capacity to raise funds to build better curriculum, embed, embed logistics learning? So basically, um, transfer all of, of, of what you're doing. Is that what is that the plan, in fact? Aaron, have we lost you? Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You froze for a moment and I thought, no. <laughs> so it's raining here, so that always makes me a little bit unreliable. Um, that goes to the heart of the whole matter. And that's really the six, the, the six hexagons that, that Martin put up there. Every single step of the project is all about enabling rather than doing. And so that means when you're talking around this idea of um, I think it was the, the third or the fourth hexagon around capacity um, modernization, for example, or for example, the whole idea is to work with national institutions. So when, when we talk about the, the capacity outcome statement and the local actors, that very much includes uh, national academia as well to make sure that local knowledges are brought in, but also local systems um, then keep the knowledge in country over time. Right, okay. Um, we have a question here, uh, Samuel. Um, Atlas Logistics is also working on logistics vulnerability of some countries prone to crisis. Maybe it's worth building synergies. Um, maybe you're already doing that, um, but do you see the potential for sort of ex extending and working with other organizations? Absolutely. Uh, we, we try, so we have a global level working group who is uh, leading and guiding us on this and at country office, uh, at country level as well, we, the project officers obviously interact with the different uh, uh, humanitarian organizations and initiatives that are taking place. And in addition to that, we also have regional approaches whenever it is applicable, when we have a group of countries, uh, project countries in a certain region, we try to bring in uh, regional actors uh, regional government bodies together as well and uh, allow them or give them the opportunity to exchange. So yeah, it's always uh, possible and it, uh, we always appreciate this support. 
Okay. At all levels. And so, I, I mean, it's, you've only been going since 2018, but um, are you coming across any any stumbling blocks, any barriers, any uh, issues that have got to be dealt with? Or, or <laughs> Aaron, you're smiling. <laughs> I mean, but or 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 is it you know developing the, on the, at the speed which you would hope? Um, I, I think the thing with, with uh, capacity strengthening is the time it takes. Um, and when, when you're working in an environment that's very used to operational speeds, the, the speed and the, the patience required for you know, effective, meaningful capacity transformation, it's, it's a lot, lot slower. So it's, it's really trying to reconcile the different speeds of of, of process, if you like. And what would you say, Samuel? I, mean, I have to say, out of the 20 countries we have engaged, the project has been interrupted, what, in 75% of them? And that's because these countries are prone to disaster. So it's always when disaster happens, then priority shifts to the response than work on preparedness. So it's a common occurrence in this project. So if there was anything that you, any extra support you needed from, from our audience today, from, our, from your community, um, what would it be? Funding, probably. <laughs> what, what, what do you need? Maybe from my side, I would say that there is a lot to be done on preparedness. We still need to raise uh, awareness. So advocacy is probably very critical at all states, not only at the country level, but at regional and global level. So hopefully the audience we have now will help uh, address this or support us in this area. Yeah. And may maybe Martin would like to come in on, on that. Um, just one last word about uh, where you want to go from here and what extra support you might need. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, this project is a, is a community project. So um, let's say we, if I would speak so, let's say as the team of the project managers, we don't do much in that sense uh, of the activities. That's all the partners bringing in expertise, knowledge, ideas, and especially on local level and on country level, uh, we have really, really quite often a very strong community of responders. They have ideas, they have concepts, they have everything. So it is, it is for us rather to, let's say, be the, the round table um, than the, the implementer. Um, of course, there's a concept of last resort where we would uh, step in at some points, but in general, it is really we, we rather try to help engage the movement that is there. And, and therefore, any organization is more than welcome always to participate, either on global level or national level. Um, just write us an email. Um, one of the main pillars of this project is a, is a working group on national level, um, where active participation is more than welcome. Um, apart from that, of course, um, looking on the next steps, yes, we would we, we believe in this project, so we would love to see it to continue. And we got already indications from several um, directions and stakeholders saying, yeah, why not? But for us now, really also the focus is to, to be able to prove and show how this concept, this elaborate concept, also really, um, let's say, brings the, the results or the, the change that we want to um, support. And secondly, I think what we also can do a lot on, on global level is advocate for this uh, for preparedness and especially these methodologies using the outreach that we have, like here in the GLM. So that's why all those documents also were created in a manner, and that's especially uh, with Aaron, um, to, to, pre to have a guide, a, a toolbox yeah, that can be used beyond this project. And we really hope that this um, is useful for other organizations as well. Yeah, that toolbox, very interesting aspect of that. Well, thank you all very much indeed. Uh, very interesting to hear what's happening, happening uh, for this project. Um, I like the sound of it. So thank you very much.